Hey everyone, today we are looking into the life of Ernestine, a servant girl who was adopted by the King and Queen of France, and would grow up in luxury until the French Revolution completely changed her life. But before we begin, I want to thank Michel Bielcourt for writing today's script. More on him at the end of the video. Marie-Philippine Lombriquet was born in Versailles on the 31st of July, 1778. She was named after her mother, who became a maid to King Louis XVI's daughter, Madame Royale, and her father Jacques was a valet to Madame Elizabeth, the king's sister. She had two sisters who died in infancy, and one younger brother, Auguste, whose fate remains unknown. As a child, her days would have been filled with helping her parents, looking after her brother, keeping the house, and playing with the children of the town of Versailles. It is most likely that she grew up in the Grand Commune, Versailles' designated servant building, but she gained one remarkable friend. Somehow, she befriended Marie-Thérèse Charlotte, Madame Royale, the eldest child of Marie Antoinette and Louis XVI. These playmates got along so well that after her mother died, Marie Philippine was taken in by the Queen as a playmate. Madame Royale or Charlotte, as she was known to those close to her, had been a proud and stubborn child, and Marie Antoinette hoped that pairing her off with the maid's daughter would teach her humility and make her aware of her privileges, and according to all accounts, it worked. Seven months after her mother died, Marie Philippine was officially adopted by the king and queen into the royal household, yet her brother Auguste was not. Also, while the king did award her with a pension of 12,000 livres, almost $100,000 in 2015, she was not given any titles, and the greater public never knew her as a daughter of France. There were multiple reasons for the adoption, including teaching Charlotte proper values, as well as solving Charlotte's loneliness, while she had no surviving sisters or female cousins. Marie Antoinette herself had been incredibly close to her sister Charlotte, after whom Charlotte was named, before they were forcefully separated, and it is possible that the Queen wanted the same for her daughter. Moreover, she had lost a baby girl the year before Ernestine's adoption, so in a way, she was replacing her lost daughter. Marie Antoinette officially renamed Marie Philippine Ernestine after her adoption, possibly after the main character from the 1765 book L'Histoire d'Ernestine by Marie Jeanne Ricoboni. Ernestine wasn't the first child adopted by the king and queen. More than a decade earlier, the queen had almost run over a poor five-year-old boy. The queen stopped her carriage just in time, and was so delighted with the boy that she adopted the orphan. He himself wasn't too excited about it, and he had to be forcefully removed from his grandmother, who knew the queen could give him and his siblings a better life. She gave money to his two sisters, and employed his brother in the court orchestra. The boy, like Ernestine, was renamed from François-Michel Gagné to Armand, after the Duchess of Polignac's son. Marie Antoinette probably adopted Armand because she herself had failed to have a child and was very unpopular for not birthing any heirs to France. In a few years, however, she would give birth to an heir, a son named Joseph, followed by another boy, Charles. This, along with his forced adoption, is what drove him to grow resentful of the monarchy and his adoptive parents. When the French Revolution hit, he ran away and joined the revolutionaries, betraying his adoptive parents. Other than Armand, Ernestine shared her life with her new adoptive siblings, Charlotte, Joseph and Charles. Charlotte and Ernestine looked so much alike that many foreign dignitaries thought they were twins. They spent every conceivable moment together. They shared a room, were treated the same by servants, 
and had the same education, in languages, history, music, dancing, conversation, mathematics and geography. Courtiers, on the other hand, didn't quite know how to treat Ernestine, who was not a princess or even a noble, but somehow lived as if she were. They usually called her Madame Royale's servant friend, and treated her with caution. She was never included in official ceremonies, which would only feature the king and queen's biological children. Ernestine and Charlotte were educated by the governess, the Duchess of Polignac, who was later replaced by Madame de Trozel. The sub-governess, who actually taught the girls on a day-to-day -day basis, were the elderly Angelique de Marcou and her daughter René. While Angelique was a beloved grandmotherly figure to them, René was always known as a stern disciplinarian, and her subjects didn't like her much. Though, René would later prove to be a vital figure in Ernestine's life. During this time, the two girls loved spending time at their favourite place on the palace grounds, the Petit Trianon, the Queen's secluded little palace, and the adjoining Amont de la Reine, a mock village where they would essentially learn about peasantry, albeit through a narrow and very optimistic view. Here Charlotte and Ernestine would have been taught to milk goats and cows, pick up eggs, pick flowers, among other things. Yet Ernestine's new family life wasn't all roses. Her adoptive brother Joseph, the Dauphin of France, who was the same age as her biological brother, suffered from ill health as he had tuberculosis. As a result, he had to wear metal corsets and often had to be driven around in a wheelchair. Unfortunately for the royal family, his condition continued to worsen, and this occurred at the worst of times. On the 5th of May 1789, the Estates General was summoned. This was an enormous meeting of dignitaries and representatives of the nobility, peasantry and clergy to discuss the king's unpopularity, the country's failing economy, the nationwide hunger, and the crown's malmanagement. Times were tense, to say the least. Because Joseph's health was deteriorating, the royal children were sent to the Chateau of Meldon, where the air was clearer. Sadly, the little boy, the bright clever Dauphin, died on the 4th of June 1789, aged 7, surrounded by doctors and his siblings, including Ernestine, who was very saddened by his death. Nevertheless, his parents were allowed no time to grieve. The king tried to postpone the estates general, but the people were too angry to listen. Are there no fathers among you? He asked. When my little Dolphon died, the world didn't seem to notice. The people have gone crazy since that day, and I can't stop crying. The queen wrote to her brother. After the storming of the Bastille on the 14th of July, things started to change. More and more courtiers were leaving in a panic every day. The Duchess, the girl's head governess, was replaced by Madame de Tourzel. The king's brothers left, and around this time, Ernestine's father and brother left court as well. In October 1789, when Ernestine was 11, things would change for good. The women of Paris marched to the Palace of Versailles to claim bread for their hungry families. They broke in and killed the queen's guards. The queen herself narrowly escaped with her life through a secret passage, and she then quickly rushed to Charlotte and Ernestine's room to fetch them, as Madame de Torzel got the queen's son Charles, the new Dauphin. What followed was the scariest night of Ernestine's life. The entire royal family and their close friends huddled in the central room of the palace, in front of a crowd of hundreds eager to kill them. Ernestine would have heard the shots fired through the windows, hoping to hit someone. She would have also heard the vile insults the crowd shouted about the Queen. After the royal family had appeared on the balcony a few times, the crowd grew less violent. The King agreed to take his family to Paris, to the Tuileries, 
and they were now the people's prisoners. Ernestine and Charlotte would remain in Paris for the next three years, and during this time, Ernestine would grow more anxious about her uncertain position, as her life relied on the royal family, who no longer had control over their fates. While in Paris, Charlotte befriended Pauline de Torcel, Madame de Torcel's eldest daughter, who was seven years older and wiser. And if that wasn't her replacement, the Queen decided to adopt another child while in captivity. When Marie Antoinette's usher died, leaving three daughters behind, she adopted the youngest one and put the two eldest in a boarding school, paying for their tuition. It is interesting to note that the Queen paid for these girls' education and still gave money and a position to Ahmad's siblings after his betrayal, yet never once took any notice of Ernestine's little brother. Perhaps Ernestine never mentioned him and feared that indulging him would mean indulging her less. The Queen's new adoptive daughter was named Zoé, after Madame de Torzel's youngest daughter and served as a playmate to little Charles. In June 1791, when Ernestine was almost 13, the family tried to escape using their connections to other royal families and to the Queen's former lover, Axel von Fersen. Several harsh decisions were taken to make this plan work. Little Charles was dressed as a girl, much to his distaste. Zoé was sent to her sisters and Ernestine was dropped off with her father in Paris. If there was a place for Ernestine's story to end, it would have been here. Had the plan worked, she may have never seen Charlotte again. The plan was faulty, however. The Queen had been adamant in not separating herself and the King from their children, so an enormous, very unsubtle carriage had to be taken. The royal family's disguises were not very convincing, and too many people knew about the plan. The royal family was caught in Varennes when the local postmaster recognised King Louis' face from his money bill. Evidently, the escape attempt was met with great public disapproval, and when the carriage returned to Paris, it was almost trampled. The royals were now put under tight surveillance at the Tuileries Palace, but at least Ernestine and Charlotte were together again. Zoé, on the other hand, never came back and it is unknown what became of her. In 1792, the Tuileries Palace was attacked twice. In June 1792, mobs invaded the palace and killed the Swiss guards. The queen, her ladies and her children were cornered in a room with only a desk separating them from the vicious crowd. The mob demanded that Marie Antoinette wear the Republican tricolor and her son the Dauphin as well. In another room, the king and his sister Elizabeth were cornered as well. Madame Elizabeth was actually injured by one of the invaders, who mistook her for the queen. The king then delivered a speech that pacified the crowd for now, but this wouldn't last. Barely two months later, on the 10th of August, the Tuileries Palace was stormed again in a raid, and this time, those present weren't simply there to scare and insult the royal family. They were taking back power from the government and punishing the royals. This time, the queen decided that it was too dangerous for Ernestine. The royal family were state prisoners, but Ernestine wasn't a royal, and moreover, she was virtually unknown. Ernestine had to say goodbye to Charlotte, and René of all people saved her. René took her to the main square before the Tuileries, where all hell had broken loose. Servants were killed, as well as guards and nobles. Invaders threw people out of the palace windows, and Ernestine saw all of this. She was scared for her life, and even if she survived, what would her life be like without Charlotte and her family? Then, René left Ernestine alone for a minute to fetch her carriage, when some townspeople noticed her. They thought she was Madame Royale because they looked so much alike and proceeded to throw a dead body of a soldier at her, which pinned her to the ground. 
a shopkeeper, also believing her to be Madame Royale, defended her and freed her from the dead body trap, just in time as René's carriage arrived. Luckily, René and Ernestine managed to escape, but most of the courtiers were caught and put in prisons around Paris. René's mother, Angelique, was eventually freed after she swore allegiance to the Republic, but others, like the Princess de Lombal, were slaughtered. Following the chaos of the 10th of August, René and her mother escaped to their country estate. Now, there is a bit of ambiguity over where Ernestine was during this time, as she was simultaneously registered at the Tuileries Palace in Paris, but when her father was beheaded for his loyalty to the king, on official papers, he said that his daughter was still living at home. It is most likely, however, that after August 1792, Ernestine lived with the René family, as the Queen had ordered. This would also be the safest option, given how dangerous Paris was. In the three years that followed, the King was beheaded, followed by his sister and the Queen. Little Charles, or Louis XVII, as he was called by the Royalists, died at the age of 10 after torturous treatment in the Tour du Temple prison. Charlotte was the only family member to survive. Well, she and Ernestine. In 1795, it was stated that Madame Royale would be released in a prisoner's exchange with Austria, her mother's homeland. To accompany her on her journey to Vienna, René was selected, being her former governess. The Austrian minister also asked if Ernestine could accompany Charlotte as well, to reunite them. René replied, however, that Ernestine could not be located, despite Ernestine living with her and her relatives. On the eve of her 17th birthday, Madame Royale was freed from the temple prison and accompanied by René, two guards, two servants, and two others who raise a few eyebrows. A maid, Catherine de Varenne, and a boy named Pierre de Saucy, supposedly René's son. Yet, René had no son called Pierre, and Catherine can't be found anywhere but in the carriage's passports. Her last name is also suspicious, because it refers to Varenne, where the royal family was captured. Furthermore, Madame Royale was exchanged for the Varenne postmaster, who had recognised the king and stopped their escape attempt. It is theorised that Ernestine may have secretly joined the group as either or both of these people. One can only wonder what it must have been like for Charlotte to see the man who had squashed her family's chances of survival. If Ernestine was present on this journey, she would have encountered another old friend from Versailles, because Charlotte was given Coco, her family's older dog, who had survived the revolution as well. In 1796, Ernestine went to a lawyer's office in Paris and was declared legally of age. She was now independent and in charge of her own finances, including her pension from the late king. She stayed around in Paris and married the proprietor Jean-Charles Germain Prampin, who was a widower and father of three. Ernestine married him in 1810, aged 32, relatively late for her time. It is unknown what Ernestine did to support herself for the 14 years between her declaration of age and her marriage. Ernestine died on New Year's Eve in 1813, at the age of 35. She died near Saint-Denis, where her adoptive brother Joseph had been buried. After the restoration of the House of Bourbon in 1814, Charlotte sent out investigations for what had happened to her adoptive sister, only to find out that she had died. Thank you everyone for watching this video on Ernestine, who was recommended and written by Michel Bielcourt, a big thanks to him, and he's even written a book on her life and there are links in the description if you are interested. If you have any suggestions, be sure to leave them down in the comments. And I hope you guys are subscribed and have notifications turned on to get all my content as soon as I upload it.
That's all from me, so I'll see all of you in the next Forgotten Life. Thanks.